So if you'll allow me a moment, I just have to reminisce a little bit. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to take a lot of time doing that. But it's been a blessing to be around Pastor Ned again. I came here in 1986 as a 20-something-year-old youth pastor who was truly a clueless wonder. I remember sitting in my office. I had a bunch of bookshelves with very few books on it. And I, I don't know if I ever told anybody this, but I, I just kind of looked around and thought, well, what do I do now? And I'm truly grateful because Parkwood, the ministry of Parkwood, launched the trajectory of ministry now over the last 30 plus years for me personally. So I don't know, I, there's not a church that's had a bigger impact in my ministry, my life, my family's life than this church, and I think they'd agree with me. My wife and two daughters are here. I have no clue where they are anymore. There they are. People around them are raising hands. They're not going to raise their own hand. <laughs> they're, they're being pointed out. We have four children. Uh, our two oldest children uh, are daughters, and they're here, Ashley and Brittany. And uh, it is, it's a pleasure to be back here. Just a few things I remember. Walking up the steps, the offices used to be downstairs, and I'd walk up with Pastor Ned, and he told me one Sunday, I don't know if you remember telling me this, he said, there's 27 steps. One for every book of the New Testament. And I think I did go back and count them to find out if he was right or not. We were walking up the steps one day, and I said, Ned, my parents are in the service today. He said, well, you think you could recognize them during the welcome? I said, Ned, they're my parents. I think I'll recognize them. <laughs> he walked into my office one day, and he was going to need to be out that Sunday. He said, I need you to preach for me on Sunday. He said, it's okay. You can pull one out of the barrel. It's okay. I thought, I don't have a barrel. I'm brand new. I, my bucket is dry. And that's how I became affectionately known as when I preached. It was white meat Sunday. Because you were going to get to the cafeteria in front of everybody. In fact, we used to be on cable access years ago. And they would record Pastor Ned and put him on this cable access channel. Well, they had used one of the old tapes when I preached. As so people said, I saw you preach, but at the end of your message, it went fuzzy for a little while, and then Ned was on there. I thought, I didn't preach long enough. I didn't cover the tape. So, Pastor Ned, thank you. And in latter years, I went back to get my doctorate of ministry at Southeastern Seminary, and Pastor Ned was my faculty supervisor. And just to see the grace he offered me, they have these things in the, in the doctoral program called extensions. It has nothing to do with your hair. It's, it's where you haven't finished in time, and so you beg for an extension. They'll allow about three of those. I was on my fourth or fifth. <laughs> but Pastor Ned hung in there with me. It, it's interesting, my field supervisor was Ted, so I had Ned and Ted walking me through this excellent adventure of getting my doctoral. Some of you got that, and some of you are gone. Which reminds me of another story. I went to preach in the Ukraine one time, and Pastor Ned was praying for me. The Ukraine's where Chernobyl was. There'd been a nuclear accident there. Pastor Ned didn't know what he was saying in his prayer, but he prayed that I would come back with glowing reports. I was thinking, I'm praying I don't come back with six fingers on one hand. <laughs> but this is a special place. It is special to get to come back to Parkwood, to get to stand in this pulpit where great men of God have stood before. And I just want you to know, you're a blessed people. Thank God for Parkwood Baptist Church. Thank God for you. And thank God that God has used this church and is continuing to to, to preach the gospel, to spread the mission around the world. That's significant. We come to this passage. By the way, I only have one sermon. Pastor Ned told me that. He said, it's great being an evangelist. You only got to have one sermon because you just show up, preach it, and leave, go to the next place. So lucky for you, it was Psalms 23. <laughs> That's where we are this morning. I got a text message from a dear brother that goes to this church, Jim Wright, a few weeks ago, right before Hurricane Florence is going to slam into the coast of South Carolina. And we really were devastated by Hurricane Matthew two years ago. We had three and a half feet of water in the chapel. It, it, it has taken us, really, we're still recovering in, in many ways. 
Fortunately, Hurricane Florence did not do that kind of damage to us this time. But Jim texted me and said, you got everything under control, brother. And it really hit me because God had walked me through a period about two years ago where I thought I had things under control. And I just want to tell you, if you're still struggling with control, if you think you've got things under control, that's an illusion. And I want to tell you, when you finally realize you don't have things under control, two things are going to happen. One of two things will happen. Either one is fear. It will scare you to death, and you'll try to hide it from anybody else so they never know you don't have it under control. So you try to fake it till you make it. Or, if not fear, faith. You come back to the only rock that will not move. And I believe that's where we see David in Psalm 23. Let me read the passage to you. I'm reading from the New American Standard, which is what Paul wrote in. He didn't write this. <laughs> David. Listen to the heart of a shepherd himself. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I think it's important to know David. David himself had been a shepherd. So he's simply taking something he knew very well and giving it a God illustration. The attributes of God fleshed out through what he had experienced himself. I just preached through the book of Ephesians this summer at the chapel, and when you get to the end of Ephesians, you see Paul talking about the, the armament of the soldier. I think he's simply looking at a Roman guard, and he's saying the shield and the feet that are shod and the breastplate and the, the belt and all those things. That's what David's doing. He's taking something very familiar to him and try, trying to make a God statement from it. And I think it's very personal. The Lord is my shepherd. See, David had shepherded sheep, probably even some goats at some point in his life. He had been a shepherd. He had lived with the sheep. He had taken care of the sheep. He had doctored sheep. He had made sure they had enough to eat here. And when they ran out here, he had to be constantly looking for the next place. They're going to get grass. And so when David comes to this point in his life, he says, you know, the way I have shepherded sheep myself, the Lord is my shepherd. Intensely intimate and personal. Normally, David is calling the Lord king or my rock or my fortress, those aren't as personal as he is my shepherd. The shepherd dwells with the sheep. Depending on who you listen to, the, the word sheep is applied to us about 200 times in Scripture. We're called sheep a lot. Why do you think God chose sheep? <laughs> If you do a little study, you find out some things about sheep. Three things I'm going to tell you this morning. First of all, sheep are dumb. You don't see trained sheep at the circus. <laughs> They're not real smart. They don't know where green grass is better, any better than you and I do. They're dumb. They're dirty. As the wool grows on a sheep, Things get in there that are living and, and, and non-living organisms and things get in there and they have to be clean. The shepherd has to constantly be cleaning the sheep. They're dirty and they're defenseless. Sheep don't have a loud bark. They don't have claws. They don't have fangs. They can't take care of themselves. They are a sitting duck, or in this case, sheep, for a wolf that would come and attack them. 
So they're dumb, they're dirty. In fact, somebody said they're much dirtier than pigs. And they're defenseless. So why do you think God uses the phrase sheep to apply to us? Well, because I'm dumb. And I need to be clean. And I'm absolutely defenseless. If not for God being my shepherd, I'm in the most of all trouble. So David is saying, with my Lord, I will not lack. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And when you hear that word, you think, well, there's things I want. It literally says, I shall not lack. If there's any need that the sheep has, the shepherd will provide it. Whether it's water, whether it's food, whether it's medicine to be taken care of, the sheep is cared for by the shepherd. And so David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. I shall not need anything that my shepherd, my God, will not provide for me. So, so if you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, who's going to take care of me? If you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, when you talked about being in control, Robert, it scares me because it seems like my life right now is spinning out of control. There's relationships, there's finances, there's health that are outside my control. I've done everything I can do. What do you do then? Well, you can either live in fear where you lay awake at night staring at the ceiling and you can't go to sleep. Your heart is churning, your stomach is churning, you're anxious, you're on edge, you're afraid. Or you can turn back to the shepherd and just say, God, I, I give up. I, I can't control this. This is bigger than me. There's no such thing as something that's bigger than God. So for some of you, what you need to hear this morning is let God be God because you're not it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And then there's a few things he does to take care of our lack. He makes me lie down. He makes me. <laughs> Apparently, sheep don't know they're tired any more than our children know they're tired. You ever tried to get a two-year-old to go to bed? You see their eyes drooping. They're getting kind of hard to deal with. Let's go to bed. Oh, I'm not tired. Our son, Robbie, We'd be on the way, this is when we lived in Gaston. We'd be on the way home from something. And he'd say, Dad, if I fall asleep, will you carry me in when we get home? I was like, sure, Robbie. He's out. <laughs> All he needed to know is I wasn't going to leave him in the car. <laughs> I did that one time with Gabe, and I don't want to ever do that again. <laughs> so he makes me lie down in green pastures. See, sheep don't recognize green pastures any better than we do. And there's time God has to make you lie down. He has to make you rest. Don't wait until it takes a Mack truck hitting you and putting you in the hospital. Seek those times of rest in the Lord that you're not forced into. You come to him for times of refreshing and rest. And David says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Let me ask you something. Where you're planted right now, is it green or brown? Because I promise you, you know the old saying, it always looks greener on the other side of the fence. It's just the way the light's shining on it. If God's planted you here, then don't look to go somewhere. He'll take care of the greenness of the pasture. He's your good shepherd. And then I love this, he leads me. This is David talking about God and his relationship with him as a shepherd, what God's doing in his life. He leads me. He doesn't leave us alone. He leads us. Y'all ever played the game Follow the Leader? I'm not going to call anybody up here to take too long and it freaked the cameraman out. But I actually did this with a group of pastors in India this spring. And it drove home the point of he leads me. If you play Follow the Leader and you do it well... In fact, one of these Indian pastors, he was doing so good, I wanted to give him high five, so I turned to do this. Well, he turned and did that the other way. I thought, well, he did what I told him to do. But I finally asked him, how did you know 
where I was going. He said, I didn't know where you were going. I just followed you. And I said, let me ask you this. Who got there first? He said, you did. I said, so if there was danger and you're following me as the leader, who's going to get to the danger first? Well, you will. That's the cool thing about following God. If he's leading you, not driving you, but leading you, he knows where we're going. And he knows the dangers that's there, and there are some. We'll get to that in a minute. But he gets there first. He leads me beside quiet waters. And again, you and I don't get that. We didn't grow up in Israel, most of us. There may be somebody here that did. But they have typically two rainy seasons in, India, in uh, Israel. And just to find water can be difficult in the desert. But it, he leaves me beside quiet waters. Why is quiet waters so important to a sheep? Well, if the water is rushing, which it can be at times in the rainy season, what happens if a sheep falls in rushing water? It isn't going to go well. Go home and put on all of your clothes and jump in the swimming pool. What's going to happen? You're going to sink. And little bubbles are going to come up for a little while, and eventually they quit coming up. And so when David says he leaves me beside quiet waters, he knew that the shepherd for him, he had done this for his sheep, but his shepherd was taking him to places where at times the water was too swift, so he would literally dig a trench off of the water just to pull up some still quiet water so that the sheep, the sheep that was desperately thirsty and needy for water could get something to drink. Sheep are afraid of the fast-moving water, but they need something to drink. So he leaves me beside quiet waters. You know, water has been an interesting thing in Scripture. When the children of Israel came to the side of the Dead Sea, it's water. We can't cross. Pharaoh's army is coming hard after us. We're, we're doomed. And what does God do? Parts the water. Mark chapter 4, Jesus tells the disciples, get in the boat, let's go to the other side. They get in the boat, what happens? Storm comes up. Where's Jesus? Asleep. Did they fear or did they have faith? I've always thought they kind of did have faith. They had faith in the storm. It was about to kill them. And yet Jesus could stand up and with one word calm the storm. Some of you right now just need your water quieted. He restores my soul. Again, this is David speaking about his Lord as his shepherd. He restores my soul. The word restore literally means to give back. And one of the words for soul is breath. So what David is saying is, when I am panting, when I can't even catch my breath, when life has come upon me in such a way that I'm at my wit's end, at the end of my rope, I'm stressed, my shepherd gives me back my breath. Everybody do that. Just take a breath. For some of you, you need to do that today. You need to turn to God and say, God, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm worn out. I feel like I'm juggling seven plates. I, I feel like everybody's out to get me. I feel like I'm not going to make it another week. You just need your breath back. And David said, he restores my soul. What a good shepherd we have. And David caught that and understood that. And then he guides me. Different from lead, it literally means to transport. He guides me in paths of righteousness for what? For his namesake. Sheep need a guide. And he said, my shepherd is the one that transports me, that gets me on the right track, on paths of righteousness. Sheep are prone to wonder. And if the shepherd doesn't pay attention, the sheep will just wander off. And they don't have sense enough to get back. They kind of use the same philosophy I do. Real men don't ask directions. I've had some of you from this church in my car. We're going places. Robert, I think we're lost. Well, I think we are too. I don't know where we're going, but we're not stopping and asking directions. They'll take away your man card if you do that. Women, you don't understand this, but if 
If you're lost and your husband finally says, okay, we're going to ask somebody, he's always going to pull into the handy pantry or whatever the quick mart is. He's going to pull in where it's on your side of the door. Honey, run in and see where we're supposed to be. Because, see, if we go in by ourselves, they will laugh at us. We have to give them our man card. Real men don't ask directions. Well, sheep don't ever ask directions. And if they don't get restored pretty quickly to the flock, they just are lost, wandering aimlessly like a sheep without a shepherd. And David says, doesn't happen to me because my shepherd guides me. He transports me from place to place. Because he's the good shepherd. And then David transitions. The rest of this passage, he changes from talking about God to talking to God. And it's been good up to this point, but it's even better when David starts crying out to his God. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, if you've ever been to a funeral, you've probably heard this psalm. And I kind of used to think, well, it's a good psalm for dead people. The dead people aren't the ones that need this psalm. Dead people aren't walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Who is? Me and you. When you're at a funeral and you've lost a loved one, and maybe some of you have done that recently and sat there and thought, God, I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Death scares us. Why is that? Because we don't understand death. Death seems so final, and yet it's not for the believer, is it? It's not for the unbeliever either, but that's not good. For the believer, it means you're ushered into the presence of God. And the valley of the shadow of death doesn't always have to lead to death, but it can mean just you're in a circumstance that is dark, that scares you to death. And David says, my shepherd leads me through that. Now understand something. That means the shepherd led you there. See, we want to pray, God, don't ever lead me near the shadow of death. There's times that that is your path to be in scary places, sometimes even dark places. But here's the good news. My Lord sees real good in the dark. I'm afraid of the dark. He's not. He took me there for a reason. And it says, even though I walk through the valley, he doesn't plant you in the valley. You may be there for a while, but he doesn't leave you there. He's taking you through the valley. And things happen while you're in the valley. You learn. You get closer to God. Do you want an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? You're going to go through some valleys. There will be dark times, but you get to the other side of it. And you sing with the songwriter, it is well with my soul. Horatio Spafford that wrote that song had gone through the valley of the shadow of death. And the story is when he's at the spot where his children had perished in the ocean, that's when he writes that song. Don't raise your hand, but are some of you in the valley right now? Here's the word from David. Here's the word from God for you this morning. You're walking through the valley. You have a shepherd who brought you there and will take you through there. Even though I'm in the valley, I will fear no evil. I won't be afraid. Why? First of all, because God, you're with me. You've never left me. You've never forsaken me. So even though right now this looks like the valley of the shadow of death for me, it's the worst thing I've ever experienced, I'm not afraid. You will have a peace that passes understanding. Why? Because it comes from God. If you look at things through human goggles, it's scary. You look at it through the glasses of faith, and you realize this too shall pass. This is temporary. God's doing something in my life Perhaps the most powerful thing he's ever done in your life. He's walking with you through the valley. I will fear no evil because you're with me. You comfort me. Isn't that great? God comforts us. God comforts us. He touches our heart, our soul. He gives us back our breath. 
He provides comfort that we can't find anywhere else. Our tendency as humans is to turn to every other thing for comfort. And we find out that didn't comfort me. When you're in the middle of a hurricane about to hit your house, you stock up on stuff to eat. (laughs) And then you eat all of it, whether the hurricane comes or not. And we call that what? Comfort food. This is supposed to make me feel better. Double stuffed vanilla Oreos make me feel better. Chicken and dumplings make me feel better. But you know what? They don't comfort me for very long. Even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, David said, I don't have to fear because God is with me. He comforts me. Two things he comforts me with, his rod and his staff. You ever seen a shepherd with a rod and a staff? If the video works, I'm going to play you a video from India with some goats. Let's see if this works. Those are goats. Coming up is going to be a shepherd with a rod and a staff. See what he's doing with the rod. What's he doing? He's whacking those goats on the fanny. What's he doing with the staff? He's using it to balance himself. So the rod and the staff, the rod could be to whack you on the fanny, to get your attention, to get you back in line, to get you moving. The staff was for stability for the shepherd. Some of them had a hook in it. He could actually grab you through the midsection or through the neck and pull you back. But quite often the staff was for the shepherd, the rod was for correction. The rod could also be used to fight off predators and enemies. And so David said, even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm comforted by the fact my shepherd has a rod and a staff and he's not afraid to use it. And so David said, I'm not going to be afraid. And then quickly he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. About all sheep do is eat. They're always looking for their next meal. And the shepherd's got to be scanning the horizon for where we're going to eat next. It's kind of like when our kids were younger and all six of us in the car, where are we going to eat? Oh, I don't care. (laughs) I hated those days. I was going to open a restaurant called I Don't Care. But the shepherd prepares a table even in the presence of his enemies. You think about David, who were David's enemies? Well, when David slew Goliath and David found favor in the king Saul, there for a while he was a friend of Saul, and Saul would throw banquets for him. His enemies were all the other people that looked at him as some young upstart. Eventually, it became Saul was his enemy. And it's real difficult to sit down and eat when enemies are surrounding you. You lose your appetite, and yet you need to eat. had a conversation with my secretary back when the offices were downstairs. When I was youth pastor here, she asked me a question just out of the blue. She said, is there going to be food in heaven? I said, well, yeah, I think there'll be food in heaven. I mean, I know there's the wedding feast of the lamb. She said, oh. I said, what's wrong? She said, my kids don't like lamb. (laughs) Yeah, we're not eating the lamb. (laughs) Jesus is the lamb. (laughs) So these sheep have had... David said, you've prepared a table, a banquet, a feast for me, even in the presence of my enemies, you've anointed my head with oil. Whether this was just a celebration, because they would use it for that, but also for medicinal purposes, it could have been to keep insects away from the sheep. The shepherd would anoint the head of the sheep with oil for a purpose. David said, you've done that. My cup overflows. When a shepherd would come to a well... There'd be a ring of cups, and he would dip out of the well and fill the cups up so his sheep could drink. The problem is the well's deep, rope's long, took a long time to fill all the cups up. If you were just a hireling, you're just going to give the sheep a little bit to drink. The good shepherd keeps dipping until the cups are overflowing. And then last, with my Lord I will remain. Here's what David says to end. Surely goodness and mercy or loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness. God's favorable blessing. His pleasant, pleasing, steady kindness will follow you. His loving kindness, His mercy will follow you. 
And I love the word follow. It literally means to charge after. It means to pursue. David had been pursued, right? Been pursued by Saul who was trying to kill him. David said, in the same way Saul has tried to pursue me to kill me, God's goodness, mercy, loving kindness is charging hard after me. And then he says, I will dwell forever in the house of the Lord. In the days that David wrote this psalm, it was considered success if the shepherd got to his designation with half the sheep. When I was youth pastor here, I'd have parents meeting, and I said, my goal is to get back with 90% of the kids I take away from here. <laughs> that always scared them. <laughs> Our shepherd has never lost a sheep. Is that your testimony this morning? Goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord my shepherd forever. Let that sink in while we go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus is the good shepherd. He tells his disciples that in the Gospel of John. He says, I go away to prepare a place for you. Earlier in John, he said, my sheep know me. They know my voice. They follow me. Nobody can snatch you out of my hand. So here's the invitation for you this morning. For some of you, you just need to rest in that, that we have a shepherd that loves us dearly and desperately. He's pursuing after us with tenderness and mercy and compassion. For others of you, you're saying, Robert, that's never been my experience because I don't know the Lord. You've never known him as your shepherd, and you need to come today to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because without a shepherd in this world, you are doomed. You will spend eternity separated from God instead of dwelling in his house forever. I'm going to pray. There's going to be pastors at the front to receive you. Perhaps it's time to plant your life at this church. This is where God has led you, and you know it. So you come. Let's pray. Father, thank you that with David we can echo our shepherd is good. Lord, thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your compassion, your mercy. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for leading us. Thank you for being ahead of us. And God, if there's somebody in this room this morning that feels like I'm right in the middle of the valley today, God, would you shine the light for them to at least recognize there is a Savior and his name is Christ the Lord. And when it looks the darkest, it's not dark for him. It's light. So God, would you call people to yourself this morning for the comfort that only you can give? And maybe just maybe somebody just needs to come forward and say, pray with me, because right now it's dark. And I need to get through the darkness. God, however you're leading, I pray that we'd respond. In Jesus' name, amen.